Matthew chapter 1, uh, you know, starts out there with that long list of names. And what's interesting about these names, if you go back and study your Bible, there's, there's actually a lot you can get out of the genealogies. Don't ever, don't ever, when you're Bible reading, don't ever come to a genealogy and think, oh great, here we go again. Now obviously they can get tough reading, you know, trying to pronounce the names right. And one way to really help, that help me in, in, in pronouncing these names right is to actually read that aloud. You know, when you come to 1 Chronicles 1-9 through 9 in your Bible reading, you know, that's, that's some heavy reading. And one way to kind of keep yourself with it and keep yourself attentive while you're reading through these long lists of names is to actually read it out loud. And what that will actually do is make you even a better reader. I know it helped me with my reading, but to actually pr try and pronounce those out loud. And uh, another thing, too, I, I would always recommend if you're, if you're want, one who wants to learn how to pronounce these names clearly and, and, and correctly, is to get a Bible that actually breaks the, those names down phonetically. Yeah. You know, it gives you the, the phonet phonetic markings there that will help you say that. But uh, there's a lot here in this chapter. You know, the book of Matthew, I think, is a great book um, to go through. I, I, someone asked me once, you know, if you could only have one book of the Bible to, to read for the rest of your life, what would it be? And I said, you know, it would probably be the book of Matthew. I mean, there's just so much. It covers everything. I mean, you got the Sermon on the Mount, verses, uh, chapters 5 through 7. You know, you've got end times prophecy in Matthew 24. And just everywhere in between, you just have all these great uh, truths of God's Word. Everything's really covered in the book of Matthew. So just going through beginning there in, in uh, Matthew chapter 1, the Bible reads in verse 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So what it's starting out here and showing us, we know, of course, we know that it ends with Joseph. And Joseph would be the what, what we could call the, the fraternal genealogy of Jesus Christ. We, of course, know that Jesus Christ, or that Joseph was not the actual father of Jesus Christ, as we'll get into that later in the sermon. And this chapter addresses that very specifically, as well as other portions in, in the book of Matthew. But what we're seeing here is the genealogy that, that traces back from Joseph. And jo this, if you notice, this is a, line, a lineage of kings. So in an earthly sense, someone who maybe might not have understood that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and just think, assuming that he was Joseph, uh, the son of Joseph, would, would, would recognize the fact that this man actually has an, an, a claim to the, to, the, to, the king, to the throne of Israel, to be the king of Israel. That's the line, that's the earthly lineage that uh, Joseph was a, was a part of. <clears throat> now it says there, um, Jesus Christ, the son of David. And that's kind of an interesting title. I mean, that's a title that is attributed to, to Christ. And if you were to read through the book of Matthew, you would see that you would see people calling Jesus the son of David multiple times. We don't have to turn there, but in Matthew 9 and Matthew 20, you have two different instances where blind men are calling out and saying, Thou Son of God, the Son of David, have mercy on us. And they're saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. And they knew, and you have to understand, when they were calling out to Jesus, he would, they were asking him to heal them, to house them to be able to see again. And he was able to perform that miracle. Well, so when they're calling out to him, they're calling out in faith and knowing that this is God in the flesh, that this is a mighty man who, who, who does great works, that does works that only a, a man could do if God were with him. They're calling out to him in faith, they're calling him there. In Matthew 20, verse 30, O Lord, thou son of God, thou son of David, thou son of David. So the son of David is a title that's been ascribed to Jesus Christ, and it's a very important one. If you would turn to Matthew chapter 15, keep something in Matthew 1, of course, because that's the chapter we're going through this evening, but if you would turn over to Matthew chapter 15, we'll see another instance where another individual calls out and calls Jesus Christ the son of David. The son of David. Matthew chapter 15, I'll begin reading in verse 21. Where the Bible reads, Then Jesus went out, uh, went thence, and departed to the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. So here another individual calling out to the Lord in faith, knowing that if he would just come and see his da her daughter, that she could uh, cure her of this, this devil that she's been vexed with. So what she called him? She calls him the son of David. So this is a, this is a, a title that, that, that uh, has been given to Jesus Christ, that people call out in, in faith. But notice also here what I'd like to point out in Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. It says in verse 22, And behold, a woman of Canaan came out, out of the coasts. It says that it was a woman of Canaan. So this is not an Israelite. This is not somebody who was of the lineage of, of she would not be considered maybe a Jew. She was, she was a Canaanite. And that's a really important, to, and we're going to get into that a little bit more as we go on in the Scripture here, in this chapter. But I want us to understand something is in, in, in Galatians chapter, go ahead and turn over to Galatians chapter 3, in fact. I want you to see this. Galatians chapter, chapter 3. 
Because we're living in a time where people are saying, you know, that uh, that 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 there's this uh, that you know there's certain people that are elect, and certain people that are chosen, and that the Jews are God's chosen people, and that and that God's dealing differently has always dealt has dealt differently with the Jews than with the, with the Gentiles in times past. But the Bible is very clear here. It's very clear. If you look in Gen uh, Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, it says, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. How is it that we become the child of God? It's by faith. By putting for our faith in the blood, shed blood of Jesus Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection. Whosoever shall do that, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For as many as you, verse 27, For as many as you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. I want you to notice verse 28. It says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The Bible is saying here in the New Testament, in the book of Galatians, it's showing us very clear, clearly that Jesus Christ, that we are all one in Jesus Christ. Amen. That God is not dealing with us differently. That God, you know, He has the same grace that He would give to the Jew is the same grace that He would give unto the Greek. And so that's something that we see often throughout Scripture is God going outside of the coast of Israel, going out and reaching out to other peoples. Go ahead and turn over to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. That was just kind of a side note. I kind of want to get back to this idea of, of Jesus Christ being called the son of David. Or that David was uh, you know, the progenitor of, of Jesus Christ in a sense. Matthew chapter 22, verse 41, While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ, whose son is he? And they say unto him, The son of David. He saith unto them, How then doth the David in spirit call him Lord? Saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? He's saying, he's putting this question to him. Of course, they've been tempting Jesus. The Pharisees were coming and trying to catch him in his words. And often when they would do that, Jesus would turn it on them and ask them a question. And turn it on them and, and try to confound them and catch them in their words. He would play their game back at them. And he's asking this question. He said, how is it that David could call him Lord if he is supposed to be the son of David? And it's kind of actually a good question, and we're going to get the answer here in a minute. He says, how is he his son? And if you notice there in verse 46, it said that no man was able to answer him a word. Now, was it because they didn't understand or they didn't know or it was just a difficult question? Or was it because they were trying to avoid the answer? Was it because they knew the answer and they're trying to avoid it? I think they didn't want to answer him because it would mean professing that Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus, how else could you call him, how could, how could David call him Lord? How could he call the Son of Man or the Son of David his own Lord? If he would knew that he was him from that was from the beginning, that would have been almost a profession of faith on their part. And they were they, that's the last thing. If you remember throughout the scriptures and the gospels, that's the that's the accusations brought against Jesus. That's what they stoned him for. That's what they envied him for. That he they hated the fact that he claimed that he was the Son of God. They didn't want. They rejected him as the Son of God. So here he is putting it to him, saying, "Hey, go ahead, answer the question and call me Lord. Call me the Son of God." They didn't want to do it. They avoided it. They, they didn't answer because it would mean professing Jesus as the Son of God. Go ahead and turn over to Matthew chapter 12. I know we're working through Matthew 1, but we're going to be over a little bit in, in place Matthew, in all over Matthew here a little bit. Because this is a good point to make here. Matthew chapter 12, <clears throat> verse 22. I'll start reading. Then they brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? So again, when they're seeing Jesus Christ do this great miracle, they're calling him the son of David. But when the Pharisees heard it, notice it's not what they saw. It's not what the miracle that they saw. It's what they heard the people say. They heard the people say, Is not this the son of David? When, they, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. The last thing they wanted to do was ascribe any kind of deity to Jesus Christ. They didn't like the fact that people were referring to him as the son of David because they knew that meant that he was the Christ. The Jews today are no different. Nothing's changed. The religious Jews today are just like the religious Pharisees of back then. They reject Jesus Christ. I mean, if you go and read the Talmud, they see some of the most blasphemous things of our Lord that you could ever imagine. 
I mean, they, they hate Jesus Christ. They don't want to hear the name Jesus Christ. It's true. Yeah. You know, we've got a great film called Marching to Zion. If you don't believe that, you should watch it. Yeah. And see what some of the, what these things that they have to say about our dear Lord. Mm -hmm. They hate Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. That's, that's speaking of anyone. But, and the, the thing is, today we have a lot of people that are saying, you know, oh, oh, the Jews and the Christians, we all worship the same God. You know, we worship the same God. God's just dealing with them differently. They might not have Jesus, but, you know, they're, they still believe in, in God the Father. They don't believe in God the Father. A lot of them, again, if, if, you, if you look into it, they don't even believe in the vast majority of the Old Testament. They're very atheistic, and they believe in their own, you know, mystic Kabbalism and things like that. It's, 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 a, it's a heathen religion, basically, is what it is. It goes on there in 1 John chapter 2 and it says, Whosoever, meaning anybody, meaning even, even the Jew, that a lot of Christian Zionists today want to lift up and say, God's dealing with them differently, that God isn't through with them, they're God's chosen people, God's still dealing with Israel. No, the Bible says that whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. Amen. So when you hear someone say, Oh, they might not believe in Jesus, but because they're the Jews, because they're the tribes of Israel, that they, you know, they still have the Father. That's not what the Bible is, is, is contradicting that opinion. Mm -hmm. That is not a scriptural opinion to have. It says, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the fire of the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. If you don't have the Father, you don't have the Son. And if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. But I want to answer this question that they that he asked them. He said. How is he his son? Remember back in Matthew 22 where he asked him, he said, If David then called him Lord, how is he his son? I think that's a great, great question. Well, I would say that he is his son the same way he is the son of Abraham. If you recall there in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So not only is Jesus Christ the son of David, but he's also the son of Abraham. So just in the same way that Jesus Christ is the son of Abraham is the same way he's the son of David. That's the one way we can answer this question. Go to over to turn over to John chapter 8. How is it that Jesus Christ is, uh, how is he the son of David? The same way he's the son of Abraham. John chapter 8, I'm going to start reading in verse 53. John chapter 8, verse 53. Art thou greater than our father Abraham? This is, of course, the Pharisee speaking, which is dead. And the prophets are dead whom thou makest. Who makest thou thyself? Jesus answered and said, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is our, your God. Ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. That's not a very nice thing to say to somebody. Call him a liar. Come on, Jesus. What would Jesus do? Well, there, there's one thing. He would call him out, wouldn't he? But I know him and keep the, and keep the saying, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. When he saw it, he was glad. He's saying, look, Abraham saw my day. Abraham was to look, was able to look ahead in faith into the future and understand my day, that the Savior of man would come and give himself a, as a ransom for many. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? You know, they're just trying to break it down with some basic math. This doesn't make any sense. Verse 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. That's how we can know that Jesus Christ, that's how he can be called the son of David. Amen. That's how he can be called the son, or the son of Abraham. How can he be his son and yet his Lord at the same time? Because yes, he came through that earthly lineage. That was the earthly lineage that led to him coming in the flesh. But long before he ever came from the flesh, he was from everlasting. Amen. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has always been. So he was able to say that he is the son of Abraham and the son of David because before either of them were, he was. And of course, they didn't like that because it, you know that was one of the, the titles that God gave himself in the Old Testament, you know, the great I Am. Tell them, he told Moses when he asked, he said, what shall I say unto, the, unto the, your people that they would believe that you sent me? He said, tell them I Am hath sent me. Or say, I Am, I, I Am that I Am. So when he says before Abraham was, I Am, that, the, the Jews knew what he was saying. The Pharisees knew that he was referring to himself as God. That's, yep. That was code. Yep. You know, anybody that would have been reading the scripture and, and knew that, they would have said, whoa, this guy just called himself I Am. That, that's why verse 59 takes place. 
Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So he escapes them trying to kill him for saying this. <clears throat> now it says that Jesus is, you know, the, the son of David. But he's the son of David according to the flesh. That's important to understand that. Go ahead and turn over to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, I'll begin reading in verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, verse 2, which he promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You can turn over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. So we see that Jesus Christ is the son of David in the sense that he is the son of David in the flesh. His flesh that he inhabited was of that lineage. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. For what the law could not do in that it was weak. Romans chapter 8 verse 3. Excuse me. Romans 8 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin condemned sin in the flesh. See, Jesus Christ was sent into a physical body like you and I have. That's why I say the, the Scripture says that He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. That's why he, we have a, a, a high priest that can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. You know, He's not a stranger to, to, the, to the trials and temptations that we go through. He was tempted in all points like as we are. So there's never anything in your life that you go through that Jesus Christ can't say, I went through the same thing. Yes, He was tempted in all points, yet without sin. <clears throat> he was sinless and he remained sinless but he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh and what I really want to focus in on in the rest of this, this genealogy is the fact that God can use us in spite of our own sinfulness or the sinfulness of our parents I mean when you read through this chapter if you, if you know some Old Testament you've re you would recognize some of these names even though they might be spelled a little bit differently and realize that there's some people up here that weren't ex listed here that weren't exactly of the most, you know, reputable character. You know, there there were there's a few individuals, you know, the women that are mentioned that were of ill repute. You know, and we're going to look at a few of them. And the first one I want to look at is in verse three. So go back to Matthew chapter one. We're going to look at Matthew chapter one, verse three. Matthew chapter one, in verse three, the Bible reads, and Judas. Now Judas would have been Judah back in the Old Testament, and he was one of the, the 12 sons, right? One of the 12 tribes of Israel. And it says, And Judas begat Perez and Sarah of Thamar. And Perez begat Esram, and Esram begat Aram. So it says there that Judas begat Perez and Zerah of Thamar. Now, who was Thamar? Well, in Genesis 38, Thamar is the, is the, is the daughter-in-law of Judah. If you remember, Jude, uh, she married. Um, she married. She married. Uh, uh, Onan was the first, the second one. I can't remember, but she she married one of the sons of Judah. And if you recall, God killed that son because he was wicked. You know, Judah had left his parents and he had gone into. A, he was living in a in a heathen. He had heathen friends, and his children grew up wrong. And we're going to talk a little bit later about that, about raising your kids. And but he. He, uh, he had the son own and own and he 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 was uh he was wicked in God's sight and God slew him so then Judah says to his other son he says go in unto thy, thy thy brother's wife that thou mayest you know raise up seed unto him and his his uh his brother didn't do it he went in unto her but then if you recall it says that he spilled the seed upon the ground and therefore God slew him so you know that's a that's a picture of what God thinks about birth control too isn't it yep. there's just a little glimpse and that's really a whole other sermon in and of itself. But what happens after that, so now that both the sons are dead, and Thamar, she doesn't have anyone else to marry. Well, Judah has a younger son. And he says, wait for him to grow up. And when he comes of age, you know, you can marry him, and he'll raise up seed unto his brethren. Well, time goes by, and the, and, the, and the youngest son gets old enough, and he's not given to Thamar. So she concocts this crazy idea. She goes to where Judah would be passing by with his friend, and she dresses up like a harlot. She dresses up like a whore, basically. And she sits by the side of the road, and Judah, you know, goes by and sees this, and the Bible says that he went in unto her. You know, that he, he gets, a, he proposes, you know, uh, has a uh, proposition with her, and, uh, you know, 
goes and enters. She says, well, what will you give me for a payment? She wants to know what she's going to get. And he's like, well, I don't have anything with me. You know, I'd give you a kid of the goats, but they're, they're all the way over there, all, you know, in another place. He says, can I give you something, you know, in, in, in to, as, a, as a sign of down payment, you know, something that will prove that I'll come back. You know, like if you might have to borrow something from somewhere, and they'd say, well, what are you going to give in return? You might give them your wallet or something like that to prove that you're going to come back and make the right payment. So what he does is he takes his, um, of course, his scepter and his, and his, uh, his, uh, his ring, you know, that would have identified that, you know, this is who it is. So he gives him the, those things, and he goes in unto her, and, uh, but he doesn't know it's her, right? Because she's dressed up, she's got the veil over her face, and of course, so, I mean, am I describing a very godly situation at this point? This is pretty wicked, right? But this is who's listed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So she, he goes in unto her, and, uh, he, and, and then he goes back later to, uh, to uh, make the payment and get his things. He sends his friends up there. To get, to get the things back and give her the kid of the goats, but she, you know, because she was playing a trick on him, she disappears. She goes away because she's actually got another thing uh, in mind. And of course, you know, she she becomes pregnant from, from that, and uh, eventually, you know, it starts to show. She gets the baby bump, and everyone's going, oh no, you know. She's, and she, they go to Judah and say, hey, you know, your daughter-in-law has been playing the harlot. And, you know, he says, well, you know, we got to kill her. You know, they, he's going to carry out punishment. So they get her and they bring her and they're gonna and they're gonna execute her and she says, you know, but you know I'm pregnant by whose these things are or some of that effect and she produces, you know, Judah's scepter and his ring and he says, she has been more righteous than I, you know, and he, and he delivers her because you know, he's trying to save his own skin at the same time. So, but I'm just trying to make the point here, you know, that Judah committed adultery with Tamar, you know, his own daughter-in-law, unknowingly, assuming her for a harlot, and. And that's, and that's somebody that's listed here in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. I mean, it's interesting that God would allow these types of people to be listed. I mean, in the first book, in the first chapter of the New Testament, you're reading about these people. These are who God allowed to be used. <clears throat> Notice also in verse 5, in verse 5, the Bible says that Solomon, Salmon beget Boaz of Rechab. Now, Rechab is Rahab. And that's from, you know, the book of Joshua. When they went in, when the children of Israel first went into the promised land, the first city that they conquered was Jericho. And in that city, they, they first they sent out the spies, the two spies, to spy out the city. And when the spies got there, they, they, they were going in for the night, and they, and they turn in to hide in this harlot's house. And she knows this harlot, Rahab, she's already heard about the Lord. She says that the, the heart of the people, you know, Mac, uh, the heart of the people melts because of you. They've heard about all the, the people who have heard of all the great things your people have done on the other side of Jordan. I mean, they're in fear. And so she cuts a deal with them. You know, this harlot, Rahab, she cuts a deal and, and says, you know, I'll help you escape the city and go back and, and, and tell the people what you found, you know, and, and as long as you'll spare my own life. And of course, they tell her, she lets them down with that scarlet thread. And uh, they say, you know, when you when let us down, just tie that scarlet thread in your window, and anybody that's in the house with you will spare. And of course, that happens, and, and it says that Rahab, uh, in Joshua chapter 6, I'll read to you, and Joshua saved Rahab the harlot. I mean, don't make a mistake about it. That's who she was. She was a harlot. Rahab saved Rahab the harlot. Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive, and her father's household, and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day, because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. So it's interesting that that's another person that's listed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and, and you'll notice her child was Boaz. Now Boaz is the, guy, is the character from the book of Ruth. And Boaz was actually a very godly man. But Boaz was a very successful man. And he, was, and he knew the law. And he was able to uh, be a blessing um, to others, and he was a very godly man. So, what the point the point is here that even though you might be, you know, you yourself might have lived a wicked life, you know, maybe not, even, maybe not quite to the extent of Rahab, but you know, we've all some of us have lived more sinful lives than others. You know, we get saved later on in life. You know, we have more of a, a checkered past. Maybe that shouldn't stop you from raising godly children. A Rahab can still raise a, a Boaz. And he can do great things. And that's, and that's a great thing. <clears throat> the thing is, what we can learn from this is that, you know, we should never just count somebody out because of sin or failure. 
just because somebody's done something evil or somebody's failed in some way, we shouldn't just count them out. We shouldn't just say, oh, you know, they messed up and the God can't use them anymore. I mean, we're reading about people that we would say, man, these guys really messed up. But God, you know, allowed these people to be listed here and God used them. Now, the other thing I want us to understand is this concept, you've all probably heard the saying, like father, like son. You know, the, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. He's a chip off the old block, right? And we know that a lot of times the way the parents are, that's kind of the way the kids are, right? And that's something else that we see in here. And this principle is something that either works for us or against us. And you'll notice there again in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, it says, And, and Solomon begot Boaz of Rahab, right? So we have Boaz, who was begotten of the harlot Rah Rahab, Rahab. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. <clears throat> you see, Solomon there, he, he married a stranger, didn't he? Rahab, she was she was a Canaanite, and she was of, you know, she was the city of Jericho. She was one of the nation of the nations that God had determined at that time to wipe out when they were to go in and take over land. They were very wicked people that did very wicked things. And God had determined to give the their land to the children of Israel. So that's who Rahab was of. She was not of the children of Israel. She was a stranger to the children of Israel. But if you notice, uh, so Solomon marries her, but what did Boaz do? His son. The, 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 the product of that union between Solomon and Rahab produced Boaz. Well, Boaz did the same thing, didn't he? When he married Ruth, if you remember in the book of Ruth, when Ruth came into the land, she was actually a Moabitess. She was of the, of the Moabites, which is... You know, uh, someone that uh, a heathen nation that God dealt very strictly with. He said that there should nobody, of, uh, no Moabite should come into the uh, the, tab the tabernacle of the congregation under the tenth generation. You know, God dealt more severely with them. But so even though this this Moabitess, this woman Ruth came in, Boaz, just like his father, you know, had learned that to show grace and mercy unto these strangers, and and that they were they they kind of learned the lesson, you know, that that the Jews hadn't learned. You know, even to say that they're not just some special chosen people that's better than everybody else. You know, that we're all of one blood. And that there was nothing wrong with, you know, marrying these people and being a blessing to them. Of course, you know, it would have been required that Ruth, and at that time, Ruth and, uh, and Rahab would have had to have been, you know, they would have been, you know, they would have become Israelites. They would have believed on the Lord. You know, God didn't want them to be unequally yoked with, a, with an unbeliever. And that's a principle that we have to keep in mind in our lives, too, that if we're the children of God, if we're born again, you know, we shouldn't go marry an unsaved person. We should always seek to marry somebody who's, you know, a believer as well. And, of course, that was the case with Ruth and uh, Boaz, is that uh, he was one that was able to, you know, he was an Israelite. And when Ruth came into land, you know, she said to Naomi, thy God shall be my, my God. You know, where you go, I will go. So she, would, she, had, she had kind of converted, if you will. Now this is something that we would all love for our children, right? We would all love our children to turn out right. We love it. We would love to raise a Boaz. We'd love to raise a child that does, you know is successful, that is able to bless others, that loves the Lord, you know. But here's the thing: that doesn't just happen. You know, the, this principle of like father, like son. You know, at, you know, as goes the parent, so goes the child. I mean, that's something that doesn't is either going to work for you or against you. And if you want it to work for you. You know, you have to put effort into it. It's not enough to just say, well, you know, I want them to turn out well. So they must, obviously they're going to. I, of course, every parent, want, no parent has a child that says, you know, I, I want him to spend his life in prison. You know, I want him to be convicted of a felony. I want him to fail in life. No child, no, no normal human being would say that to their child. Every, ch every parent wants their child to succeed. Now, if you would turn over to Ephesians chapter 6. Because it's not, you know, this is conditional. We want this, but there, and there are the promises that our children can grow up and be used mightily like a Boaz. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, if you're there, look at verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now notice what it's saying there. It says bring them up. It doesn't say put them in it. It doesn't say, you know, you just set them over there and hopefully it rubs off. You know, just bring them to church and hopefully the preaching is enough. It says you've got to bring them along with you. You know, if you want to raise your child to read the Bible, you're going to have to, they're going to have to see you reading the Bible. You can't just say, you know, it's, 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 it's a certain time of the day, it's time for you to read your Bible. You know, if you start reading your Bible, your kids will start wanting to read the Bible. Whatever, whatever you do, your kids are probably going to want to emulate you and do that. 
You know, if your kids, if you start taking your kids out soul winning, they're going to want to go soul winning. You know, if you start bringing your kids to church and hearing the preaching, they're going to want to hear it. I mean, I've got a little boy, you know, and Corbin John, and he'll go home and sometimes I'll walk in the door and he'll have his little tote out and he'll have his little Bible and he'll have it on there and he'll just be going, rah, 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 which probably doesn't sound too far off the mark for me, but he'll be just ratting and rambling and he'll be just preaching a sermon and, man, I wish I knew what he was saying because it sounds good. But, he, but why does he do that? Because he sees his dad get up and do it. He sees his dad stand behind this pulpit and preach and he's saying, yeah, I want to be like my dad. So this is, a, this is how you bring up your children. You be an example. You know, you show them how to do it. Not just tell them, show them. That's why it says in Proverbs 22, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's a promise in the Word of God. You know, that if we'll be faithful, if we'll do the things that we're supposed to do as Christians, as God's children, and, and show our children how to do these things, that they will do them. And that they will not depart from it. Bring them to where you are in the way. Don't try to just push them out ahead of you. Here, I want you to be this. You know, show them, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. Do as I do, that God can use you and bless you. You see, this promise that they will not depart from it, that they can be trained up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, you know, it's conditional upon the parent's own walk. It's conditional upon the parent's own testimony. I mean, there's nothing that will that will... Take your children out of out of the out of the, the, the Christian life quicker than hypocrisy. I mean, when you have a parent that's saying, you know, you shouldn't smoke, you shouldn't drink, you shouldn't do this, you should do that, but then they turn around and see you doing those things, you know, that they're gonna say, Well, this isn't real. This doesn't mean anything to you. Because it doesn't. That's the truth. Kids have this unna you know, this just natural way of being able to just cut through it. They can see right through it, you know, the, the, the facade. They can see what's really going on. Because they're often watching when we, when, they, when we think they're not. They're paying attention when we think they're not. They're like little sponges. So it's important that you know, we in our own lives as parents be sincere. Be sincere and true and honest about our walk with God if that's what we want for our children. <clears throat> There's that old saying, your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Your walk talks louder than your talk talks. It's more about what you do than what you say often with your children. Now, the next thing we could kind of focus in on this chapter is would be the virgin birth of Christ. I mean, this is a this is a doctrine that's heavily emphasized in chapter 1 here. So let's go ahead and turn back to Matthew chapter 1 and look at verse 16. Matthew chapter 1, verse 16. Matthew chapter 1, verse 16. The virgin birth of Jesus Christ. I want to notice in verse 16, the Bible reads, And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. I want us to notice how careful the King James Bible is to call Joseph the husband of Mary. It's very careful. It makes, it's very delicate. It makes sure that it's very clear that it does never call Joseph his father. And that's very important because that's, that's where Christ gets his deity is from the fact that he is God's son, that he is the son of God. It does this again in verse 19. Notice this. It says, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man. It didn't say, and then Jesus' his father. It says, jo it says, Joseph, her husband. Joseph, the husband of Mary. It's very careful to call Joseph the husband of Mary and not call him, not call him Jesus' his father. For sake of time, I won't have you turn here. Just stay where you are. But listen as I read from Luke chapter 2. Where we'll see the one time where somebody calls, where Mary actually calls Joseph, Jesus' father. She calls Joseph, Jesus' father. And we'll see that Jesus' reaction is that he actually rebukes her. The Bible says, and it was a very light rebuke. You know, I don't want kids in here getting an idea that, you know, once you turn 12 years old, it's okay to just tell mom how it is. You know, again, remember, we're talking about Jesus Christ here. This is the Son of God. All right? And he was dealing with something that was very important. He wasn't just shooting his mouth off. He wasn't just talking back. He was reminding his mother of who he was. Bible says in John chapter 2, and by the way, your mom doesn't need to be reminded of who any of you kids are. She knows probably better than you think. John chapter 2, or Luke chapter 2 reads, And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. So she says right there, Thy father and I. She's referring to Joseph, her husband. Thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, 
How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And if you were, if I had had you turn there, you would have noticed when he says my father's business, father's is capitalized. He's referring to God, his father. He's saying, look, in a very gentle way, he's reminding her, look, he's not my father. And don't forget who I am and who my real father is and what it is I'm here to do. I must be about my father's business. Now, other translations, they're not so careful. Other translations of the Bible, and this is why here at this church, at Faithful Word, we are King James only. That's the only Bible we use. We reject all these other versions. And you'll see why. And this is just one example. We could sit down and again, there's been another great documentary that was put out by Paul Wittenberger, uh, New World Order, New World Order Bible Translate, Bible versions. You know, Brother Hunter's got the shirt on. You know, great film. If you've ever wondered about the, the King James issue, why is it that you guys only use it? Well, I'm just going to give that film will explain a lot more than I can in one sermon. But I'm explaining to you very briefly right now this and this one thing that should make it clear to you that these, these other versions are corrupt, that they're evil, that they're wicked, that they have an agenda. <clears throat> other translations are not so careful to tamper with the virgin birth. And that's a major doctrine. You can't get the virgin birth wrong. And you can't mess that one up and, 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 and say you believe in the God of the Bible. I mean, the Bible is, you know, emphasizes the virgin birth. Luke chapter 2, verse 27 reads, And then came the Spirit, the, the, and he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus, so it, the King James does refer to them as the parents. But you have to understand this. You know, if you were to see, you know, a, a, a child with a mother and a, and a man and a woman, you would assume that must be the parents, right? Now, has anyone, you know, you, we would even refer to our step parents as parents, right? That person is still our parent. Are they, you know, they're 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 parenting us. So it says there, when they brought the uh, the parents brought the child in the child Jesus to do for, uh, for him after the custom of the law. Then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace. I'm going to jump down to verse 33 for sake of time. Because here the King James clarifies it. It says, And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. So the King James, very, very, again, very careful to make sure not to call Joseph Jesus' father. Saying, Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Now, the American Standard Version isn't so careful in Luke chapter 2, verse 33, where it says, And his father and his mother were marveling at those things which were spoken of him. The English Standard Version is not so careful as the King James when, in this chapter where it says, And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. The, I, there, I can't keep all these acronyms straight. The NET, So the child's father and mother were amazed at what was said about him. The NAB, the child's father. The NIV, very popular Bible, right? The NIV, the New International Version. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said of him. You say, well, that's not a big deal. I mean, but is it not a change? Does it not affect doctrine? Is it, and, and, and you say, well, they must have just made a mistake. They might, maybe it was just an error. They didn't realize what they were doing. But here's the thing. If we're Christians and we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Right, that's what we, that's, I mean, is that not one of the most basic definitions of, of what a Christian would be? Would you just expect a Christian to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? That God in heaven is the Father of Jesus Christ? So let's say that's me and you, right? And we're having a casual conversation. And I just say, not even, I, I purposely made a, an, uh, you know, said it on purpose. I just misspoke somehow. And I called Joseph Jesus' father. Wouldn't you take the time to correct me? You say, whoa, 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 who's Jesus' father? Now you would check me out on that, right? I mean, how, that, that's not just a slip-up, I mean, when you read these versions. That is, that is a calculated change in these, in these. And that's just one example of many. Where they're slowly trying to indoctrinate in people that Jesus isn't God. Because isn't that what all the other religions teach? That Jesus Christ is not the Son of God? Oh, he was a great prophet, the Muslim will say. Oh, oh he was the brother of Satan, the Mormon would say. You know, they'll say all these other things about Jesus Christ, but they're very, they, a lot of them, they don't want to call Him the Son of God. So it's no coincidence that these corrupt versions are here calling on one of the most key, essential, and quite frankly, simple doctrines of the Word of God. They're, they're, they're corrupting it. They say, well, what's the big deal? Well, the Bible, I'll tell you what the big deal is. The Bible says in its last chapter, Revelation 22, verse 18, For I testify unto you that every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book if any man shall add unto these things, 
God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. There is a curse upon people that would alter the word of God. That would change it. And if thou any man shall take away from the words of the prophecy of this book, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. I'm telling you something. The people that sat down and wrote and said, let's make Jesus, let's make Joseph his father in this verse, their name has been removed from the book of life. That's that, that's, is that not what the scripture says? If any man shall take away from the words, if any man shall add from the words, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Do not tamper with God's word. And there's a lot of people that are trying to do it. And it's not, you know, and a lot of it is, of course, to try and make money. You know, they've got to keep coming out with new versions and selling people new versions so they can make money. You know, the love of money is the root of all evil. But at the same time, the devil knows how to slowly corrupt these words in God's word and, and, and slowly start to shape the minds of people to believe false doctrine. You see, the virgin birth is an emphasized doctrine in the first chapter of the New Testament, as we have seen. It's something that goes over in verse 16, 18, 20, 23, and it ends in verses 24 and 25. Matthew 21, 24, and 25. You can read along where it says, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto his wife, and he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. It's very careful to not call Joseph his father. It's very careful to let you know that Mary and Joseph did not come together until after he was born, that she was a virgin when she gave birth to Jesus Christ. So how could these translations get this wrong? How could they mess this up? The errors in these other versions, I'm telling you, they're calculated. They're here they're not people say, oh, they're errors, they're mistakes. No. They are heretical alterations that must be pointed out. Yeah. And when we do so, when we start, when one of the things that really bolstered me as a king, becoming King James, is when I started to see these errors. We should bolder our position. We say, well, how do you know you have the Word of God? How can you say that King James is the Word of God? Well, it's by faith. I mean, I can't, you know, it, it's by faith. I mean, you say, well, what does it say in the original language? The same thing it says in the King James. It's the same thing. You don't have to go back to another and learn a foreign language to understand God's Word. You, I mean, do you think God, who is not the author of confusion, doesn't want to put His Word, which you know, which is what the, the, the seed of the Word of God, which saves our soul, you don't think He wants us to have you know, our, the way of salvation made plain and clear to us in the English language? Of course He does. Would He not preserve that same Word? You know, we believe that by faith. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, We also have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto until you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in the dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. You know, they didn't have these people just making stuff up. It wasn't the will of man. Yes, man was used. Yes, man was an instrument. To pen down and write the words of God. It goes on and says, But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God used man to write his to pen down his words. And then God preserved that word for us in the King James. Every word I believe in the King James Version is correct. It needs no alterations. It doesn't need to be updated. It doesn't need to be changed. They say, Well, it's hard to read the King James. Well, you just need to get smarter then. You know, maybe God just wants you to get a little smarter. You don't need some dumbed-down version of the Word of God. And often, if you read these, all, these other versions, it's hard to even understand what they're trying to say. I mean, there are verses in there that don't sound anything like the original. They don't sound anything else like the King James. With that in mind, let's look at just, just one last thing, if you would, in verse 20. Verse 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save people from their sins. So it says there, thou shalt call his name Jesus. And then it tells him why you're going to call him Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus is the name of our Savior. He is the one who saves us from our sins. And if you were to, you know, and if you were to go back to the Greek and try to figure out what does the word Jesus mean, it means a Savior. It means a Redeemer. I mean, do you see how simple it is? I mean, the Bible interprets it for you. You don't have to go back to another language to try and figure out what all these words mean. And we have to be careful, especially when it comes to the name of Jesus, because there is a movement today 
to, to tell you that the name of Jesus is not the name. Yeah. When the Bible says there is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. <clears throat> we need to be aware of the Hebrew roots Judaizers and the sacred name people. And early on in my Christian walk, I kind of got mixed up in this. And I got mixed up in it in the same way a lot of people are getting mixed up in false doctrine on the internet. You know, not enough time in my Bible, too much time in the public library, logged on the internet, learning about Yeshua and Yahweh and all these crazy other names that they come up with. <clears throat> and that's, again, that's another sermon. You know, a lot of these things that we're talking about can be whole sermons in themselves. But we're given the name of Jesus Christ here as our Savior. That's Amen. the name. Amen. Jesus. If God wanted to put another name in the Bible, don't you think He could do it? I mean, God who, who hangs every star in its place and knows everyone by name. God who's, whose hand spans the universe. Can He not write a book and preserve it? I mean, that seems like it's pretty small potatoes for God. So, you know, and that's where I got at this point. You know, I got all mixed up with these guys, and one day I remember I just, I just came to the point and I said, you know what, either this book is God's Word or it isn't. 